America has always been uncomfortable with an ugly reality, the prospect of war. But in the face of deadly weapons, economic instability, and terrorism, the immediacy of maintaining national security continues to be the major challenge faced by almost every nation in the world. In an age of push-button solutions, there is a misperception that technology alone will bring victory in war, and that battles will be fought at distance without huge loss of life or the physical destruction that war inevitably brings. But warfare requires putting soldiers on the battlefield, where a bullet has no political affiliation and victory is measured by living or dying. The battlefield is everywhere. One military unit that is continually preparing for combat are the U.S. Navy SEALs. It might be rescuing prisoners from terrorists, gathering intelligence on enemy troop movements, or destroying a target with an airstrike. Such missions are called direct action. The SEALs have served in every U.S. military action since Vietnam. Under an operational designation officially described as conflict other than war, they remain active in operations that often go unreported. While it is true that every SEAL dreams of combat, their doctrine isn't about anger or recklessness. Instead, it is a crucial combination of observation, invisibility, and controlled violence. As the emerging pattern of smaller localized world conflicts brought a timeliness for their unconventional methods, SEALs have continued their training in sabotage and surprise precision attacks, which sometimes could include civilian targets. Few forces in the world have the training to resist a SEAL surprise attack. Compact in size and heavily armed, a 16-man SEAL platoon will attack under any circumstances and can project a killing power far in excess of its physical size. In a matter of minutes, these specially trained forces can overcome an objective with aggressive techniques like fast roping, landing onto their target ready to shoot in seconds. The SEAL trademark is to strike a target in merciless fashion. The ambush of an unsuspecting opponent may appear cold-blooded to some, but its purpose is not just to destroy, but to demoralize an opponent. For the SEAL, how, when, and where he kills his enemy is often as important as the actual destruction of the target itself. It's like the samurai. If the guy aspires to be a SEAL, he's aspiring to be something like a samurai. Disciplined and control. Not some lethal weapon that we unleash like a Rambo. It's teamwork. In the 21st century, information is power. Possessing the military capability to gather intelligence often provides an alternative for expanding and shaping the different foreign policy options of the United States. There's been co-mingling of the SEAL forces and the CIA. It's called sheep dipping, where you may see more of it as in the drug war in the future. You may see Navy SEALs more involved in riverine operations. In fact, they're doing a lot of training of that in, in uh, South America and Central America. And some of those might get sheep dipped to the CIA. I don't want to spend longer than two minutes here. For those who define these regional actions as conflicts other than war, the threats to the world's economic and social stability from technology transfer, espionage, and terrorist drug trafficking are monumental. Navy SEALs and their special boat units have the capability to provide a limited and controlled military response to certain situations not worthy of a full-scale military action. SEAL operations might require clandestine, covert, or low-visibility tactics supported by political oversight from the national level. One of the most important missions is war on terrorism. When the SEALs train for intelligence gathering missions, they enter enemy territory and carefully search the target area. The enemy might be a country, a drug smuggler, or an arms trafficker. Any information they find can help them piece together a big picture of enemy activity. Unlike conventional troops who are trained to bring massive firepower onto a target, often indiscriminately, 
SEALs avoid any killing which might compromise the safety of their small force and jeopardize the success of their mission. In naval special warfare, you have an exceptionally highly motivated individual who is a risk taker. Somebody is going to go out there, take on the biggest challenge that you have, and oh, by the way, they're going to succeed because they don't have the word failure in their vocabulary. Our guys thrive on the challenge. And when there are things going on in the world, they want to be the first one there. That's what we live for. You know, the cream rises to the top. These guys all want to be the cream. When that SEAL goes into combat, they're not out there with a fleet to support them. There's no room for error. You need to make sure that that individual who's standing on your left or on your right is going to be there before and after the bullets start flying. No SEAL has ever surrendered or been captured. No SEAL has ever been left behind by his comrades. To an operator, the only thing worse than losing is quitting. U.S. Navy SEALs are a military unit that constantly trains for war in every part of the world. We train like we fight. You know, you'll come back, you go out, do some uh, immediate action drills in the daytime shoot, come back, grab a bite to eat if you have time to do it, uh, carry on your next mission. You might be going out, getting in the boats, doing it over the beach, but uh, that's your job. It's what we train for, and there's no problem doing it today because we might have to do it in the war tomorrow. said that no clan ever survives first contact with the enemy. In battle, a soldier's conscious mind shuts down as instinct and training take over. In the first confusing seconds of combat, disciplined reaction to the suddenness of battle will decide who lives and who dies. There is no glamour or mystery about preparing for war. For SEALs, it's a work ethic. Platoon life is built around maintaining a high state of readiness. The SEALs know that the winners in wartime are the ones most prepared to react. They know we're a pretty high-speed bunch, and we're at risk a lot. We go in harm's way a lot. Hell, our daily routine is harm's way, for that matter. When you're practicing, when you're training, some people crowd the lower end of the margins. They stay down to 25, 30 percent. I think we ought to be training up here 90 to 100 percent, really hanging it out as far as we can hang it out without getting it cut off, so to speak. Because when you go into combat, it goes to 150% straight away, and you can't really train for that. You can only train close to it. If SEALs lose unit cohesion under an attack, they lose their strongest asset, discipline and control. Every SEAL platoon practices certain procedures, or SOPs, designed to help them recover should they lose unity during a fight. Let's go, let's go. After training with the Chilean Special Forces all day, this platoon moves directly into a live fire immediate action drill. Inside the action, the speed and intensity of eight men running and shooting in rough terrain is difficult to comprehend by anyone who has not experienced it. When you're actually in a contact drill, it seems like it's going pretty fast because you, you have a lot of things going on trying to find out uh, where your contact's coming from, uh, what you can do about it, what kind of terrain you have to move around, and worrying about what kind of ammunition you can throw down, shooting, grenades, your rockets, whatever you can get out there. Basically just to get out of the situation and uh, carry on with your mission. During the contact drill, there's a lot of things that happen very quickly. That's why it's uh, very important to continue to maintain that communication and uh, safety. Looking right and left down the, the line of fire, watching behind as the drill goes down. It's real important that everyone maintains verbal and eye communication 
throughout the, the entire execution because you take a look afterwards at a video and it'll look like you're moving pretty slow. But uh, during the execution of the actual movement, it, everything uh, happens pretty quickly. Usually when they send us, it's a hot target and we're there to take it out. The three things come into play. We have to be decisive, we have to be aggressive, and most importantly, we have to be ruthless. There's just not enough of us normally, and when we get there, we have to take care of business. A SEAL platoon is not defined by numbers. Instead, it is a detailed knowledge of policies, procedures, systems, and weaponry that gives a SEAL platoon a force projection beyond its physical size. SEAL's vulnerability begins when their attacking force reaches the enemy's first line of defense. At this point, the friction of war begins to impinge upon the success of the battle. In a conventional battle, you accept a certain number of casualties. In the fog of war will naturally create 5% casualties, maybe high 10% casualties or whatever. In the SEALs, their mindset is that any casualty is a result of somebody's mistake. They lose one man in a very small squad or platoon, it has a serious dent in their whole operation. In a gun battle, all team members are listening. They know that a lull in the firing means the enemy is reloading or that he might be regrouping. At the first sign of a lull, the team begins to fall back. Breaking contact and regaining unit cohesion is the first step to recovering the initiative. The ability to execute a coordinated group movement during a firestorm of surprise, fear, and bullets is how they maintain group cohesion. In a carefully orchestrated maneuver, the squad breaks contact by a series of fire and maneuver movements. Despite their array of weapons, SEAL platoons are not large enough to endure a drawn-out engagement. If we don't have a lot of firepower, we have eight to ten minutes of a sustained wall of lead going out there, and that's it. We've blown our nut, and it's time to get out of there. If we come across a large force, we're, we need to call in some, uh, some helos to get us out of there or some fast movers for some, some fire support. This SEAL squad is practicing a coordinated leapfrog movement using live ammunition. Their tactic, while basic in concept, becomes complex under live fire. In the stressful noise and confusion of moving and shooting in rough terrain, men can become separated or stunned into indecision. Even the most experienced veteran can forget simple procedures. In combat, this is called the fog of war. To survive as a unit, each man in a SEAL squad must know how to recover his senses and adapt to a chaotic situation. This squad has regrouped into a full muster to maximize their firepower before breaking contact with the enemy and making their escape. This is called finding the door. The ideal SEAL strategy is to win without fighting a pitched battle accomplishing the most destruction with a minimal amount of effort. Their attack relies on intense violence and the impact of shock force to create a temporary appearance of superior strength. In any fight, it is essential that they first stun their target with an all-out fury, then quickly fade away in the confusion.
For SEALs, operating far from the protection of the main force, the difference between living and dying is measured in seconds. Despite the appearance of overwhelming firepower, an eight-man squad's rate of fire is limited by the amount of ammunition they carry, often not more than 4,000 rounds. A story is told of a Bud's class standing at attention in front of a large sand berm. Suddenly, one of the SEAL instructors quietly climbed to the top of the berm. There, in full view of the class, he shielded his eyes from the sun and stared out to sea, searching the entire horizon from side to side. When he finished, he walked down the hill and stood in front of the class. Does anyone know what I'm looking for, he asked. No one replied. He paused before he spoke. I'm looking for a war. Thank you.